Welcome to Christian Thought. I'm Jerry Adams, the host of Christian Thought. In today's lesson, we are going to look at the second sola of the five solas of the Reformation, Solus Christus, Christ Alone. My thesis for this study is these words. This office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Christ, who is prophet, priest, king of the church of God, and may not be either in whole or any part thereof transferred from him to any other. And that is taken from the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, chapter 8, section 9, and also from 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Those statements, both from the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689 and from the Scriptures, are my thesis for this study, Solus Christus, Christ Alone. So we know that Christ is n not the last name of Jesus but rather Christ is a title. Christ means the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One promised by the Lord, that is Yahweh, as the proper name given in the Old Testament in the Hebrew, Yahweh, and the Law and the Prophets. Christ Jesus is known as the Holy One of God from Psalm 16.10, Acts 13.35, Psalm 89.18, Isaiah 55.5, 5, and John 6.69, 6, and Revelation 3.6. Jesus Christ is also known as the Son of God, Psalm 2.6-11, Acts 13.33, Hebrews 1.5, and Hebrews 5.5. 5. Jesus Christ is also known as the Son of Man, and you got Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, Daniel 7.13, Matthew 12.30, and 17.9. He's also known as a prophet, or the prophet, in Daniel 18.15, and John 6.14. And there's many other titles given to him, for example, in Isaiah 9.6, Unto a child is born. To us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Christ, and in him alone is forgiveness of sins. He is our righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1, 30-31 And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So in Acts 4, 10-12, we hear this, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man standing before you as well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And also in Acts 2.36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. As we continue to look at the five solas of the Reformation, I again want to take us back to the 16th century and discover why the Reformers, especially Martin Luther, was compelled to go against the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, concerning the only way of salvation. Why did he have to bring to the forefront Christ alone? What was it that the church was teaching? Luther made the question simple. How is a sinner made just before a holy God? He discovered while teaching Romans and Galatians 
that the church had departed from the purity of the gospel. The scriptures taught that a man is accounted righteous, that is justified, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, while the Roman Catholic Church was teaching that a man is made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ and good works as defined in canon law. That is, according to the sac that includes the sacraments known as sacerdotal salvation. It was through or in the church that salvation is given to the people rather than in Christ Jesus alone. Really, what the Papists did is take salvation away from Jesus Christ and gave it to the church. Well, Jesus said in John 17, 1 through 5, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may, be glorifying, may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus said he accomplished the work, that is, to give eternal life to all the Father, get the, all the Father had given him. The Roman Catholic Church said Christ's work was not sufficient in and of itself, but rather we must increase our justification by doing the new law. With his authority, Jesus Christ commanded his disciples in Matthew 28, 18-20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Church of Rome says that, we are, that they are the source of truth. They cite 1 Timothy 3.15. If I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. By this verse, they claim to themselves all rights to the truth and authority to define what that truth is. Since the church has the truth, salvation is through the church, so they argue. While the Roman Catholic Church does have a true understanding of who Jesus Christ is as defined in the ecumenical creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and a Chalcedian definition of the faith, it is the application of Jesus Christ in his gospel that caused the schism that boils down to the doctrine of justification. How is a sinner made righteous before a holy God? I want to bring to your attention two areas of the Roman Catholic doctrine, Roman Catholic Church doctrine that the reformers opposed and corrected. One is, is Christ alone? That is, his death and resurrection intercession and his intercession alone sufficient to obtain the righteousness to be just before God. And two, do we need the intercession of the saints and of Mary in heaven to intercede for us to God. So to answer these questions, we're going to look at what the Council of Trent states. Now Trent is Rome's response to the Reformation. It was issued in 1536, or 1563. It was 46 years after Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses. And it's 30 years, 33 years after the Augsburg Confession. In it, they define Roman Catholic doctrine and pronounce anathemas on all who disagree with them. I picked a few canons that are relevant to our study. So in the Council of Trent, under the degree of justification in chapter 10, 
It's entitled, On the Increase of Justification Received, It is Decreed. Having therefore thus been thus justified and made the friends and domestics of God, advancing from virtue to virtue, they, through the observance of the commandments of God and of the church, faith cooperating, cooperating with good works, increase that justice which they have received through the grace of Christ and are still further justified. And on the sacraments in general, in Canon 1, in the Council of Trent, they write, If anyone saith that the sacraments of the new law were not all instituted by Jesus Christ our Lord, or that they are more or less than seven, to wit, baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, order, and matrimony, or even that any one of these seven is not truly and properly a sacrament, let him be anathema. In Canon 4, if anyone saith that the sacraments of the new law are not necessary unto salvation, but superfluous, and that without them, or without the desire thereof, <clears throat> men obtain of God, through faith alone, the grace of justification, let him be anathema. And on baptism, in Canon 5, if anyone saith that baptism is free, that is, not necessary unto salvation, let him be anathema. And on Canon 7, if anyone saith that the bapti baptized are, by baptism, made debtors but to faith alone, and not to the observance of the whole law of Christ, let him be anathema. And those are the statements from the Council of Trent, the Roman Catholic response to the Reformation. So Canon 7 on baptism is the smoking gun. In the footnote given by the Council for the whole law, they cite Galatians 5, verse 3 which states, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obliged to keep the whole law. Now understand that circumcision here is also known as being baptized into Christ. Being circumcised in the heart by the Spirit is also taught in Scripture as being circumcised in the heart by the Spirit. And that's what Paul is talking about here when he says there, what, what the Roman Catholic Church is talking about. Paul, on the other hand, is talking about being circumcised in the flesh as the Jews were circumcised. And they confuse the meaning of circumcision, the Roman Catholic Church does. They make it a fleshly thing, whereas Paul... No, no, the Roman Catholic makes it a spiritual thing, whereas Paul's talking a fleshly thing in Galatians chapter 5, verse 3. So in the canon, they are teaching that baptism obliges one who is baptized to keep the new law. And their no law is the seven sacraments in order to be justified or to increase justification given at baptism before God. It is then the works of the new law whereby one is justified and not by faith in Christ alone. This is what Martin Luther said no to. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 4. So we go back to Galatians chapter 5. And I already quoted uh, Galatians 5 verse 3. So if you take the verse in context, it says in verse 4, if you accept circumcision, you are then obligated to keep the whole law. Verse 4 says, Therefore you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. So Martin Luther writes in his commentary on Galatians of this verse. These words, you are fallen from grace, must be carefully considered, for they are of great importance. He that falls from grace 
utterly loses the atonement, the forgiveness of sins, the righteousness, liberty, and life that Jesus Christ has merited for us by his death and resurrection. And instead thereof, he purchased to himself the wrath and judgment of God, sin, death, the bondage of the devil, and damnation. And this place strongly fortifies our doctrine concerning faith, or the article of justification, and marvelously, marvelously comforts us against the rage of the papists that persecuted us because we teach this article, that is, justification by faith alone, he's talking about. In another place, Luther writes, when, then when he goes on to reveal his son in me, Paul states the purpose of the gospel, which is the revelation of the Son of God. This is a doctrine quite contrary to the law, which reveals sin, death, wrath, and punishment of God. Now, if the gospel be the revealing of the Son of God, then surely it accuses not. It threatens not death, nor brings to despair, as the law does. But it is a doctrine concerning Christ, which is neither law nor works, but our righteousness, wisdom, sanctification, and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Although this thing be more clear than the sunlight, yet the blindness and madness of the papists has been so great that of the gospel they have made a law of charity and of Christ a lawgiver, giving more straight and heavy commandments than Moses himself. And that also is from his commentary on Galatians. Luther is correct to say that the new law is more severe than Moses. Moses' law was designed to teach us of our sin and bring us unto Christ. Galatians 3, 19-29 The new law is designed to turn us away from Christ and enslave us to the church of Rome. For if Rome taught Christ Jesus correctly, the new law would not have been formed. Romans 3.28 For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now, concerning the saints in heaven interceding for us, the council, or the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent on the doctrine of the sacrament of masses in chapter 3 on masses in honor of the saints, the council writes this. And although the church has been accustomed at times to celebrate certain masses in honor of saints, not therefore, however, does she teach that sacrifice is offered unto them, but unto God alone, who crowned them. Whence neither is the priest wont to say, offer sacrifice to thee, Peter or Paul, but giving thanks to God for their victories, he implores their patronage that they may vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we celebrate upon earth. And again they write in Canon 5, If anyone saith that it is an, that it is an imposter to celebrate masses in honor of the saints, and for the obtaining their intercession with God, as the church intends, let him be anathema. So the question is, do we need the intercession of the saints and Mary in heaven to intercede us for us to God? So the answer to that question is in Hebrews 4, 14-16. And I quote, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then have confidence to draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And also in Hebrews 10, 11 through 18, 
and every priest stands daily at service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Notice here that I have underlined here, but when Christ had offered for offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin. Now remember that when we go on. Also in Hebrews 7 verse 25, consequently he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Who's making intercession for us? That would be Jesus Christ. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to draw to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the household of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So let's pull this together. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Mass is a sacrifice unto God. And this sacrifice is truly propitiatory. That is, the Mass is truly a sacrifice that satisfies God's justice and wrath, making Him righteous to forgive sins. This, the Mass, is another sacrifice other than that Christ gave on the cross. They teach that this is given to, given to God to obtain intercession of the saints in heaven for us to God. The quotes from Hebrews teach that Jesus, that Jesus Christ one and only sacrifice is sufficient to forgive sins for all time. No other sacrifice will be accepted by God no matter what kind it be. Jesus Christ is our only only high priest who intercedes for us. We need not another, neither the saints nor Mary, Christ alone. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This brief look at the teaching of the Roman Catholicism shows us the reason Martin Luther and all other reformers were compelled to teach Christ alone for salvation apart from the works of the law. It forced them to develop the gospel, true evangelical gospel, meaning of justification by faith alone, and to find the proper use and understanding of good works in the Christian life. Just as the law has a proper and lawful use, 1 Timothy 1, 8-11, so do good works in James 2, 14 and 7. James uses the term good works, whereas Paul, Peter, and John use the term love one another. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 1 Peter 2, 22 and 1 John 4, 7. All the apostles agree that love results in good works towards others not to gain or merit forgiveness of sin, but rather as an outpouring of life in Christ. 
So you have 1 John 4, 7, and it states, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So let's move on from the historical uh, 16th century and just look at a few couple of verses here from Romans chapter 3, 19 to 22. And I'll give some commentary on that. And it'll help us get a better understanding of Christ alone. As we work through it, you will see that. So starting with verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. The Apostle Paul had just proved through sound arguments that both Jews and Gentiles are under the law. Whether they were given the written law or the law was written in their hearts by what they do and how their conscience accuses or excuses them, Romans 2, 12 through 16. All have the law and therefore all are answerable to God. Not one person is exempt. When the day of judgment comes, we all must give account of ourselves for the things done in the body. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we all must appear before the judgment seat of God of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So verse 20 of Romans chapter 3. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Paul explains to us that the law is the knowledge of sin. Just as the tree in the Garden of Eden was the knowledge of good and evil, the one law, don't eat of that tree, could teach what is good if they do not eat of that tree, or what evil is if they disobey and eat. So it is with the Ten Commandments. When we disobey, and we all have, we know what sin is. Sin brought death. For in a day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. For the wages of sin is death. Our conscience bears witness against us, and we use all kinds of means to blunt our internal accuser. It says guilty. It causes shame fear of judgment and punishment and anxiety. We look for ways to put our sins and guilt out of our minds. Some turn to substances to numb us, to stupefy us. Others turn to man-made religion and self-help reformation. None of these will do, for guilt remains. In Galatians 3, 19-29, Paul asks, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Or, the law was our guardian unto Christ until Christ came. Or, a schoolmaster and teacher of God and what he expects from us of blessing and curses, of sin and of righteousness. The moral law teaches us how to relate to God and men. What is love and what is hating? What is moral and what is immoral? What is life and what is death? Now there is also in the law a ceremonial law, and these encompass the sacrificial rites, the cleansing rites, the separation and holy rites. These are the things that, that God gave the nation of Israel at the time that he brought them out of Egypt and gave them the Ten Commandments and then all the other laws to separate them from all the other nations and peoples of the earth, which are called the Gentiles. You have Israel and you have the Gentiles, and Israel was God's people, and he gave them rights and separation laws in order to distinguish them from the other nations of the world. He also gave blood atonement sacrifices. These prefigured Christ's better effectual sacrifice of himself 
They covered sins and guilt, turning away God's wrath, these being types and shadows of a better sacrifice to come. He also gave to Abraham, even before the law, the circumcision. Now, circumcision was a teacher that our heart is in need of change and regeneration. That is, we must be born again. So you see Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, and Romans 2, 29. In another picture, circumcision is the putting off of the flesh with its lust and its evil passions. You got Colossians 2, 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ resulting in holy living and purifying for good works. Titus 2.14 Now also in the Old Covenant, there was given a tabernacle, being a shadow of the true heavenly tent of meeting, a mercy seat where the blood was taken to present to God the satisfaction given for our sins, making God legally just to forgive sins. He also instituted a priesthood for a mediator between God and man. So the law teaches what sins are and how God has commanded it to be dealt with. In the law, God's holiness is revealed. He is separate from sin. Sin greatly offends God's holy nature. Yet he is merciful and long-suffering toward those who acknowledge their sins. And he has a specific way we are to acknowledge sin. Isaiah 5:16. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. Every time a sacrifice is given in the Old Covenant, there is an acknowledgement of sin. An atonement is given to cover that sin. The sacrifice and confession of sins go hand in hand. And God says, this is my way and no other will be, uh, will be pleasing to me. David writes that it is godly to acknowledge their sins and confess them in the Psalm 32. And he writes this, I acknowledge my sin to you. I will not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. In this you find, then, that it is the godly people who actually confess that they're sinners. Now, I know that seems opposite to people, that God would think of people as, as godly if they're also sinners. But that's what the Word of God says. It is the godly person that acknowledges their sin, they confess them to God, and they receive the cleansing from that, through that confession, by faith in Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for those sins. And it's the godly who acknowledge their sins and confess them. The most ungodly attitude is to cover our sins in a self-righteous delusion. We must agree with God and his law that we are sinners. Interesting enough, the prophets indicted the people of Israel and Judah for not worshiping God the way he specified. They quit going to the temple. They built altars in unauthorized places, sacrificed to false gods and idols. All of this showed that they would not acknowledge God or their sins before him. They were not relying on God. This is the true worship when we do it God's way. Our ideas do not matter. Jesus had a conversation with a woman in Samaria, in Samaria about the true worship of God. Let's hear what he said in John 4, 19-24. The woman said to him, Sir, I, per I perceive that you are a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped on a mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So let's move on in our exposition of Romans chapter 3, 18 through 22. But now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Now the shadows must give way to the true, new, and living way. What is the righteousness of God? How are we to suppose to understand this? Let's work through this and find out. I think that the righteousness of God is manifest in two ways. One, in requiring a life to save a life, upholding a just judgment. Or that is, God's justice is upheld in fulfilling the just requirements of law that says a soul that sins shall die. And two, the righteousness of God can be personified in Jesus Christ because he is said to be our righteousness. So let's go on and explain each one of those. So number one, in Leviticus 17.11, and this is what I was talking about, one paying for another's sins. And God had given us this. It says, for the life is in the flesh, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it, that is the blood, for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. God made this law so that sinners had a way, God's way, to cover or expiate sin. A life for a life a transference of guilt onto another as a substitute or in the place of one to be forgiven of sins. That substitute must bleed out its life. This is to make an atonement. Because of the wages of sin is death, two options are given for the sinner. One, he dies in his own sins, bearing the penalty of himself, or... Since God cannot remain just and righteous to forgive without a satisfaction of a law, he declares that satisfaction can be made by a substitute atonement as prescribed in Leviticus 17.11. In this way, Jesus Christ is manifesting God's righteousness. And my second one, since Jesus Christ, who manifests God's righteousness, is sometimes said that Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God, because it is the Son of God who gives his life to save many, below I have strummed together some scriptures to try to prove this point. I think I have shown a plausible argument for personifying the righteousness of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So, my first text is Hebrews 10, 3-7. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. 
Each year the sins were brought forth and remembered, showing that righteousness had been had not been perfected in these animal sacrifices. Now I'm speaking of the Day of Atonement here when I say each year. In the uh, Israel's rites of, of atonement, they had what they call the Day of Atonement, and this was celebrated once a year. And each year, the high priest would go in behind the veil of the Holy of Holies and sprinkle upon the Ark of the Covenant, the blood of the sacrifice, in order to cover up sins for that year for the people of Israel. And this was done year by year. And we learn from our text in Hebrews 10, 3 through 7, that those sins could not, those sacrifices and blood from the bulls and goats could not take away sins. And there was remembrance of them every year through that sacrifice in the Day of Atonement. So we find that something better had to come. Sometimes we forget how important it is that Christ took on a body. And not just a body, but one of the line of Abraham, the promised offspring. Paul sees great importance in it and exhorts Timothy to teach it. In 1 Timothy 3.16, Great indeed we confess the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, and believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. We find that the body, Christ is to make a better sacrifice. In Hebrews 9, 23-28, with the blood of that body, a covenant is made, just as Isaiah prophesied. So, my main point here is, when Christ came in the world, God gave him a body. And with that body, he is to make a sacrifice for sin. And that sacrifice for sin is to bring about a covenant, as we'll see. In Isaiah 42, 6-7, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you, and I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, and to bring out of the prison from the dungeon, and from the prison those who sit in darkness. Notice here when Isaiah says, I give you as a covenant for the people. He is writing about a person. One, the Lord called in righteousness. The one Yahweh called in righteousness. In the new covenant, he promised that sins will not be remembered anymore. It states in Hebrews 12, 8 12, also in Jeremiah 1, 34, I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember them their sins no more. Here we have it. This is the righteousness of God, the promised branch of Jesse, to be a covenant manifested in the flesh, Christ given a body for the blood to inaugurate a new covenant with a promise that sin will not be remembered anymore. So Jesus could say in Matthew 26, 26-28, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So in Isaiah 53, 10 through 11, the prophet prophesied this concerning Jesus Christ. Yet it was, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, 
he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Any Christian knows that Isaiah 53 is describing the death of Jesus Christ with details of what God is accomplishing in that sacrifice. Here, Jesus' soul, in his blood, is made an offering for guilt. This is that propitiation Paul mentions in Romans 3.25 that expiates guilt and sins making God just and righteous to justify, that is, account us righteous or impute righteousness to us, to those who have faith in Jesus Christ, being saved from the wrath of God. This is all in the person of Jesus Christ alone. No wonder Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1.30, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. I have purposely personified the righteousness of God in our text because it is in Christ that our righteousness comes. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sakes he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then consider all the in Christ and in Him statements here in Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of, the glor of his glorious grace which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Now, if that isn't solus Christus, Christ alone, I don't know what it is. Our union with him, our union with Jesus Christ, in Romans 5, 12 through 21, being found in him, Philippians 3, 9, and having our life hidden with Christ in God, Colossians 3, 3, all these point to one person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. I think it is warranted then to personify the righteousness of God rather than make it only a moral quality of God in his acts of redemption. And John Gill, he agrees with me on this. He writes concerning the righteousness of God. <clears throat> For therein the righteousness of God is revealed. By the righteousness of God is not meant the essential righteousness of God, the rectitude of his nature, his righteousness and fulfilling his promises, and his punitive justice, which, though revealed in the gospel, yet not peculiar to it, nor the righteousness by which Christ himself is righteous, neither at, either as God or as mediator, but that righteousness which he wrought out by obeying the precepts and bearing the penalty of the law in the room of his people, 
and by which they are justified in the sight of God. This is called the righteousness of God, in opposition to the righteousness of men, and because it justifies men in the sight of God, and because of concerning which Jehovah, Father, Son, and Spirit have in it. Jehovah, Father, sent his Son to work it out, and being wrought out, he approves and accepts of it, and imputes it to his elect. Jehovah the Son is author of it by his obedience and death, and Jehovah the Spirit discovers it to sinners, working faith in them to lay a hold of it, and pronounces the sentence of justification by it in their conscience. Now this is said to be revealed in the gospel, that is, it is taught in the gospel, that is, the word of righteousness, the ministration of it, it is manifest in and by the gospel. This righteousness is not known by the light of nature, nor by the law of Moses. It was hid under the shadows and the ceremonial law. It is brought to light only by the gospel and is hid from every natural man, even from the most wise and prudent, and from God's elect themselves before conversion, and is only made known to believers to whom it is revealed. And also, John Owen writes of the righteousness of God, and he gives four categories for it, but he states here in this one. In the way of recovery from this state, generally declared in the first promise of the blessed seed, by whom this righteousness of God was to be wrought and introduced, for he alone was to make an end of sin, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, Daniel 9.24, that righteousness of God that should be the means of the justification of the church in all ages and are all dispensations. And that's from John Owen's work on the doctrine of justification by faith through the imputed righteousness of Christ. So let's wrap up our lesson today. Sola Christus is what the church is built upon, even as Paul states. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Throughout the history of the church, many have invented rites and rituals that God did not command, and replaced Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of salvation. They retained the name of Jesus, but set out to be themselves the Christ. Roman Catholic New Law is one such false Christ, leading many to perish in their sins. It was the reformers who got enlightened by his spirit with his word to bring again the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people. They insisted on Christ alone and were willing to die for opposing the Roman Catholic heresies. I think that it has that it was greed for power and money that led Rome to apostasy. They lost their first love and went after the world. Let that be a warning to us all, for we are all prone to wander. So that includes our study of Sola Christus, Christ alone. I hope this has been a blessing to you and have a and you have a better understanding of Jesus Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith. If you've enjoyed this video share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Christian Thought and click the notification button bell so that you don't miss any of the future videos if the Lord wills and God bless. God is faithful by whom you have been called into fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.